You know, I've never understood why when people hear the word organic chemistry, they want to run out of the room. You know, organic chemistry is not as bad as everybody makes it out to be. It's a fascinating subject, and you need to understand what we mean by organic chemistry and what the implications of that meaning are. Well, let's start out with what do we mean by organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon, of carbon compounds. That's what I want to talk about, carbon. Now, yes, it can get very complex because because of the nature of carbon. You see, carbon can form an unbelievable variety of materials. But that's the true secret to life. The true secret to life is the fact that you are mostly made out of carbon compounds, and your organic compounds are what keep you going. Well, I have three words I want you to remember when it comes to organic chemistry. Shape, shape, shape. That's right, shape. Shape is everything in biology. The shape of the molecule is what organic chemistry is all about. Let's, let's start out with just to take a, let's just take a look at carbon and, and compare it to some of the other atoms that are so important in living systems. We remember that bonding takes place from the electrons in the outer shells. And I hope you remember that hydrogen has one in its outer shell, oxygen has two, nitrogen has three. But carbon is unique because in its outer shell, there are four electrons, which makes carbon very, very prone to forming covalent bonds. Remember, these are called valence electrons. And therefore, when you have a valence electron that is going to be shared, we're going to call that a covalent bond. There will be no overall transfer of electron because the, the electronegativity is not great enough to rip electrons, generally speaking. Carbon does not have that kind of electronegativity to rip electrons off of other molecules. So carbon can form lots of different variations. In addition to all of that, carbon can form chains. And that's where things start getting very, very interesting. Let's take a look at carbon. I happen to have one right here. Now, this particular carbon, as you can see, carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. And we're going to put these four little guys in here to represent the four bonding electrons, the four valence electrons of carbon. Shape is everything, you guys. And I want you to get a picture of this carbon and the way it's going to bond in your head, assuming that I can get all of these things the right length. Now, that being said, remembering that carbon has this shape to it. We want to take a look at how carbon is going to bond. Now, in its simplest form, carbon is just going to form something called CH4, okay, methane. And this is the end, uh, I mean, you know, if, if this were the end of the story, we wouldn't be talking anymore because this is just, you know, some kind of dead end molecule. It's not going to be bonding with anything because carbon is, is sharing electrons with four different entities, both of which are, or four of which are hydrogen. And so this carbon in sharing the four electrons with hydrogen has filled its outer shell and that is the end of the story. But it's not. Because you see what carbon can do is carbon can do some other things. For example, carbon can actually bond with other carbons and start to form these long chain-like substances. For example, let's put two of these carbons together. And when we can put two of these carbons together, we can now bond other things to it. So, for example, we can form a two-carbon chain with, look at that. Now, remember, carbon has to have all four of its bonding sites filled. Well, in this case, look what we have. C2, H6. C2, H6. So carbon can form chains. Now, I don't have enough of these little beads to show you everything, but man, oh man, we can do some great things. For example... Here is, now, now here's something cool that we do in organic chemistry. We, we show these bonds with these shared pairs of electrons with lines. So get used to that. I, I'm going to do that a lot, okay, where I'm gonna, going to show bonds, covalent bonds with lines. Very typical. This molecule, the one I just built, is ethane. Well, there's other molecules that we can do with carbon, too. For example, carbon obviously can add a third one. Let's take a look at propane. One, two, three carbons in the chain. That's important. We can keep going. Four. You want four? There's four. Butane. Now, but that's not all. Carbon can do something else that's kind of cool, too. 
One of the things, and boy, talk about stability. Watch this. Sometimes carbon will form what are called double bonds. Now, let's see what we're going to do with this one. Let's take this carbon, and now I'm going to change my little wooden prongs to springs. Okay? This particular carbon has, there's two, and let me just throw the other bonds on there too, just so you know I'm not like cheating you here or anything. There we go. Carbon, get in there. There we go. All right, there we go. One, two, three, four. Now, I put these springs in here because I have to illustrate something. There's no such thing as a spring bond or anything like that, but I got to bend them, and I can't bend wood with my bare hands. Okay, so here we go. Look at that. Ah, there we go. Now, what I've done here is, remember, carbon has four bonding sites. Now, let's think of what's going on here. This carbon has one bonding site filled with this hydrogen, one bonding site filled with this hydrogen. Let's put two more hydrogens on here. One and another one. But look what happens. Now this molecule looks a little bit different than the other ones we've had. This molecule will only have four hydrogens. Why? Because you have a double bond between the two carbons. Well, this extremely stable situation is going to cause some real big shape changes. Now, let's take a look at this, for example. Butene. Okay, now before you saw the molecule butane, and now we have the molecule butene. The difference, look, there's a double bond right here in one butene, and there's a single bond right here in butane. Trust me, that's important. You okay with double bonds? Double bonds are important. But that's not all. Carbon can form branches. Now this is where it gets interesting. Let's go back to butane and but let's go back to butane. One, two, three, four, right in a line, right? But it doesn't have to be in a line. For example, we can branch off and form another whole group of carbon chains right up in here. This happens to be something called isobutane, but, but nevertheless, you see what's happening here. Carbon doesn't have to be one big straight line thing. It can be branches, and from that branch could come other branches, and on and on and on it goes. And lastly, carbon can form very complex molecules, some of which can be represented by rings. For example, Here's carbon, and notice it has formed an enclosed structure called a ring. This is called cyclo, because it's circular, hexane, because it has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. All right, so cyclohexane, notice what we have here. Every carbon, if you count, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, I can go all the way around and count four bonds on every carbon, and I better be able to do that because carbon will tend to have all of its bonds fill in covalent bonding. And you can even combine some things. Look, a ring with double bonds, benzene. How cool is that? You got the ring, but notice you don't have as many hydrogen because some of the bonds are taken up by double bonds. Cool stuff. Now, one more thing I want to tell you about carbon, at least a generic thing about carbon. It forms structures called isomers. How important are isomers? Ooh, baby, isomers are important. What is an isomer? Well, there are three different kinds of isomer I want to tell you about. The first kind of isomer is called a structural isomer. All right, now a structural isomer, boy, we're going to come back to three important words here, shape, shape, shape. Okay? Think about it. Let's look at these two. What do you see that's different about them? Well, what you see is that you have the same, if you count carbons, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Count hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They have the same formula. Yet these are two completely different molecules that will behave differently. Why? Shape. They have a different shape. Structural isomers have a different arrangement of what we call covalent partners. Their arrangements are different. This particular carbon, instead of being on the end, is in the middle. It makes all the difference in the world. Okay, that's a structural isomer. Let's move to something called a geometric isomer. Boy, these are important. In a geometric isomer, we get this double bonding effect again. And you see what happens when you double bond things is you lose any kind of rotational ability around the axis of the bond. Ooh, let me say that again. You lose rotational ability around the bond axis. Whereas a single bond, you can get some kind of rotation. The double bond is much more rigid.
Now, what happens here is you get this, because of this inflexibility, you don't get the freedom of movement, and, and, the, and the, there is no rotation of atoms. Here are two geometric isomers. Now, there is no such thing as X's in chemistry, but these could be anything. Okay? Now, in this particular geometric isomer, notice you have two X's here. In other words, the X's have been redistributed. Shape, shape, shape. Let me give you an example of this. You know, most of you out there have eyes, and do you realize you have a chemical in your eye called rhodopsin? Now, there's a part of the rhodopsin molecule that's sensitive to light. Guess what happens? When light hits it, that thing changes its shape. It actually isomerizes, and it's no longer sensitive to light. That's how we pick up light messages in our eyes. So what happens is light beam hits it, the molecule isomerizes, and then after a series of reaction changes back so it can pick up light again. Isomers, very important in biological processes. And the very, very last isomer I want to tell you about, enantiomers. Enantiomers, sometimes called optical isomers, are kind of like your hands. You know, if you look at your hands, you say, oh, they're both the same, aren't they? No. One's left and one's right. Try superimposing your hands on top of each other, and you can't. They're mirror images of each other. Similarly, we have optical isomers, and take a look at this, okay? What has happened in this case is we have the CH3, but look what has happened in, in this situation. The NH2 and the H have reversed position. See, on this side, or on this molecule, the NH2 is on the left, and on this molecule, it's on the right. Why does that matter in the shape? Well, imagine that this molecule had to sit in some kind of Oh, enzyme, shall we say. And the enzyme was expecting the NH2 to be on the left. And you try to hit it with an isomer where the NH2 is on the right, it's not going to work. So you see that this mirror image thing can determine how efficient a particular isomer is going to work. We find this a lot when we, when we uh, study pharmacology. If we design an isomer of a certain drug, it doesn't work as well as the other one. This whole introduction to carbon becomes crucial and the most important thing, shape. Don't forget that. As we go through carbon chemistry, shape is everything.